You're listening to Real Facts on Real Estate with Sean Patrick Maloney. Welcome to Episode 5, A Real Estate Agent's Guide to Performing a Comparative Market Analysis. I'm your host, Sean Patrick Maloney. Thanks for joining me this week. Last week we talked about making a competitive offer in a competitive marketplace and getting it accepted. This week I want to talk about performing comparative market analysis. A lot of agents out there right now are making them competitive market analysis. No, I'm just joking. But in reality, it's a comparative market analysis. The first step to getting it going is actually getting a lead that wants to work with you. This is a stage we'll talk about in a future podcast. Once you get a lead that actually wants to contact you, you're going to set up the first meeting. On the first meeting, it's really important before you go to do a lot of stuff. First, you want to research the home. Researching the home high and low and checking out the marketplace, seeing what else is on, seeing what's sold recently, and making sure that you understand that market inside out because this seller is going to ask you a lot of questions about the house, what you think it's worth, and what you think the local market is like. And if you don't know about houses that sold down the street, I can guarantee you that they do because they're getting ready to sell their home. Next, you're going to set up your agency disclosure form. You want to have all the information filled out before you go there so that when you produce it, it's easy and you can just go through it. Next thing, put together your marketing presentation. You want to make sure that you have everything talking about the marketing of your company and how they're going to get the house sold. You may even want to bring in a personal bio and many other things. Different people call it their listing package. Everybody has a different listing package. At minimum, I suggest it has your bio, the marketing information about your company, a little bit of information about the company that you work for, and then a little bit of information about the town. Possibly you may have their field card, otherwise known as public record, and other information you have about the house, just so that you can go over it with them while you're there. On the public record, when you go to the house, it's always a good idea to ask them, is this information correct? Because if it's not, they need to take it up with the town and address changing that information before you list it. That way there, when buyers or agents look at it, they have the right information from the beginning. When you go to that first meeting, always remember the agency disclosure form is a mandatory Massachusetts form, so you want to get that done. You also got to remember the way that we describe it as an industry professional is we say, this is a Massachusetts mandatory form. I have to fill this out with you. So if three agents go there to produce a comparative market analysis for the person and two of them show it and the other one doesn't, who do you think looks like the non-professional? It's the person who doesn't show the disclosure. The disclosure does not say that they have to work with you. It tells them that they have rights in the state. So use it and be a professional. While you're there, you're going to take a walk around with them. Have them show you the place and watch where their passions are. Watch how they talk about different areas. Make sure you go high and low and ask questions. You want to know all the features. That way there, when you're looking at the comparative market analysis, if there are customized features, you have those in your mind and you're ready to price those in. Ask a lot of questions to them. Ask them what they did with different areas. Why did they do that? What year did they do that? Get as many details as you can and take notes. That way there you can make a hot sheet. A hot sheet's a thing where you're going to put down everything that's been done on the property over the past bunch of years, what they cost possibly, and all those different things so that when buyers come in the house, you can hand it to them and say, here's all the common questions as well as here's the updates. A good hot sheet goes a long way when it comes to selling a home and also stops you from getting a lot of useless questions that you could have put down on this. Then the next thing you want to do while you're there is ask them what do they see in the value. See if they have an opinion. They may have a value in mind that they're dead set to. Find out what that is if you can. And then, if they do give you a value, just ask them, what are your comps if you don't mind sharing with me? Have them share their comps with you, because that's going to tell you right away whether they're realistic or unrealistic about the pricing. No one wants an unrealistically priced home. There's no point in putting them on the market unless you get a pre-agreement that says they're going to come down to a certain price by a certain date. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Next, I want you to talk about you. So we left that to last. I want you to talk about the marketing you do. I want you to talk about all the different ways that you're going to get the home sold. If you're an existing agent that has a long track record, maybe you talk about your record. If you're not, you work for a brokerage. They have a good track record. Talk about that. If that doesn't work for you, talk about the technology. But find the best points of what you are and what you can best describe and what you can talk about without them saying, hey, this guy really doesn't know what this woman doesn't really know what they're talking about. Make sure that you're talking about what you know about. Then, last but not least, after you go over all that, I want you to set a next appointment, typically for the next day or two. 
That appointment in there is to come back and produce the comparative market analysis. Some agents will give you a comparative market analysis on the first meeting and try to sign up the contract. I'm not saying that this method doesn't work. I'm just saying that I'm a little bit questionable about making a comparative market analysis on a guesstimate of what the house is worth versus an actual comparative market analysis. If I go in, in the home, I can see the condition of things. I can tell what's going on. And I explain to clients the dangers and pitfalls of dealing with agents that come with a contract the first time. So you got to remember, we're all being competitive with each other. So some people say, hey, the guy who needs to come back, he obviously doesn't know the market. Us who come back the next day say, hey, the guy who comes over and shows you a price the first day, he doesn't really look at the house. He just looks at the generalization of the marketplace and wants to sell houses quick so he underprices the home and doesn't look at the customizations and features. Both methods work. Whichever one you're doing, just make sure that you follow one and you consistently mark down what you're doing. And then if you give it a try on the other side and see how it does, see how often you convert. But anyways, you set up that next day comparative market analysis presentation. You go home, you do your homework, you go you take your comps and everything like that. Let's talk about that. During doing comps, a lot of agents are kind of having mistakes on what a comp is. Just because something's in the same price range doesn't make a comp. Just because something has the same number of bedrooms doesn't make it a comp. We need to think about everything that comes into play value-wise as an agent. So now let's think, and I'm just going to say some of the categories, but wouldn't we say location matters? Possibly the view matters. We can talk about the lot, corner lots, main roads, side streets, years built, types of homes, location of homes, numbers of home available in the marketplace versus numbers of buyers that are looking in that area. So as you can see, not everything's a comp. I can't teach you all that's a comp in this one little podcast here. Over the next few months, I'm going to be doing different podcasts, and one of them I'm going to make sure I specialize in on comps and how to choose the right comps to a CMA. So make sure you come back for that one. But do remember, you got to make sure these comps make sense because putting a house in that's a three-bedroom, one-bath, and it's an old little tiny cottage, and it's like, you know, three Bailey bedrooms to putting on a three-bedroom, one-bath that was built this year, how can you think that that's going to relate to it in price? It's not. Other things to think about when we're doing the comparative market analysis is the square foot method, there's an appraisal method, and then there's a regular CMA method. A lot of times the square foot method in New England is terrible because we have a lot of issues with the fact that we have all different style houses in all different style areas as well as all different style lots. You may have a lot that's 10 acres in Middleborough and it may be only worth 200 grand where 10 acres in Weymouth may be worth $2 million. So when you're using the square foot method to show the price of a house, it might not include some of this stuff. So just be really careful in that and just make sure that when you're going to produce this square foot method that the number is pretty much on square with what you're thinking because I've gone in there and I've seen it way too high and I've also seen it way too low. If you're going to use the appraisal style, you're going to need to get a book or subscription to an online website that helps you value what a garage is worth, what a bedroom is worth, what a bathroom is worth, and also the pluses and minuses and how to really work them. It's not the easiest style approach, but it's a pretty accurate style approach when you want to dial in heavy on a high-end home and really figure out exactly where it's going to fit in the marketplace. And it also will separate you from the pack because not many people are doing them. The most common one is just a regular CMA, which is where we're taking all the like properties and the computer's generating a number based on averages and telling them a range of prices that they would fall within. One thing that you can do is after you get to the end of a comparative market analysis, you can ultimately dictate the numbers. So if you're looking at that number and you need to adjust it a little bit, it's always not a bad idea to dial it in because I can tell you if it says a range of 7 to 735, they want to sell for 735 and it never changes on that. I always make sure I explain that 7 to 735 is telling them condition-wise, but then I realized over the years, I'm like, why am I explaining this? Why don't I just adjust the budget to what it should say, which is no problem, because at the end of the day, they're asking you your opinion on the value of their home. So never underprice a home, but also never overprice a home. I know that sounds like a slippery slope, but when you overprice a home, if you put it in too high of a price, you're going to end up carrying that listing. And when you're carrying that listing, you're going to carry the marketing costs. This is fine for some of the larger agents who have lots and lots of listings and they have cash flow, but for a smaller agent, you may be responsible for buying newspaper ads when you have no money coming in, and then you're hoping to get that money back only to find out that the place doesn't sell. So this is why you never want to carry a listing. You also don't want to end up with a bad track record. We are like athletes. We have statistics. Everybody's keeping statistics on us. How many days on market? 
list price versus sale price ratios and everything. And if you're taking on a lot of listings, letting them mature 100, 120 days and take 20 and $30,000 price breaks, when I'm a seller and I look you up on the internet and find out your statistics, I'm not too impressed and I have no reason that I want to work with you. So make sure you think about that while you're doing this. After we put this number together and we're pretty sure about the number, we then, and I say after because I don't want you doing this before and getting lazy, but do the Zestimate, the RPR value, the Redfin value, or any of the other free home valuation tools. This is going to give you a great wide range of prices, but it's going to show you if everyone's starting to narrow in on something, it's going to give you a little more confidence in the number. But also with the Zestimate and the Redfin estimate, there's a very good chance that your client has already got it and they're looking at that price, and they're expecting something to do with it. So this is going to give you time to do your homework and field. What are they using for comps, everything like that, because they'll show you that. And if you don't do that beforehand, and you go in there, and you have a number of 700, and on there it says 840, you're not ready to field that question. You're going to look like you don't know what you're talking about, even though this estimate has no idea what it's talking about. But you need to be ready to take that question and win with it and tell them why. That's why you need an agent, and that's why you need someone that knows what they're doing, because if you go at that price, you won't sell. Do you know why you won't sell? Because you won't appraise out and go over appraisal and go over the dangers of overpricing a home and how if they can't get an appraisal, they can't get a loan. If they can't get a loan, they can't get a buyer, and ultimately how that can lead to a dead deal and way far in the game because it takes about 20 days after the offer is accepted before we even do appraisal. So you find out you're not selling your home after you've already had it on, and then when you come back on the market, everybody always thinks there's something wrong with your home instead of that there was something wrong with the buyer's credit or that there was something wrong with the appraisal. Or if there is something wrong with the appraisal when it comes back on, who wants to pay too much for the home, which inevitably means you're either negotiating with the buyer you have or you're taking a price break on the home and moving the price down. Either way, it's a lose-lose situation for you, and you've lost days, money, interest, and time. Now that we have our number together and we're all ready to go, it's important to think about the presentation. The presentation of this is everything. We're talking about something that's going to sell for multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars and pay thousands, if not tens of thousands, possibly even hundreds of thousands of dollars in pay. So let's go out and get that comparative market analysis professionally bound, or at minimum, let's get a little binder and put it in there. Clear sheets, laminated sheets, thicker paper, anything we can think about to make this seem more high-end, more luxurious, and a better experience that is more cared about and thought about. Inside that packet, you're going to have your comparative market analysis. You're going to have, again, their field card, public information. You may have your bio again. You definitely want to make a cover sheet. On the cover sheet, it's common to have a picture of the house, the address, and the client's name, possibly the logo of the company, as well as your name and information there so that they can see it and it's a nice presentation. I usually grab that photo when I go to the first meeting and do the comparative market analysis of original meeting just to find out what's going on with the home. I take a quick photo while I'm there. It doesn't need to be a professional photography thing. It's just a quick photo. Other things that you can have in there will be local menus or all different things that just show you understand the marketplace and that you're going to be marketing the place to everybody. Sometimes some agents will even have a guided marketing plan. Now that they've seen the home and gone in, they'll write a customized plan that will tell the person everything that they're going to do from the first open house dates to whatever. This can work out great because it will actually set out a schedule and guideline of when you're going to do things. The other good thing for it is it's like self-obligation because once you've told them you're going to do things, you have to do them. So it's like you put down all your dreams and goals that you wanted to do marketing wise in here you put it down there and then they're going to hold you obligated to make it happen because you already told them it's going to happen once you have that all together it's time to set the meeting and get out there and meet back up with them in person when you get there and meet with them in person the second time it's important right now to just establish relationships you want to say a few things that remind them that you know who they are take some things from the first time you talked and bring them up just so it shows them you're paying attention you know who they are you want to work with them and you're interested in a relationship and not just the money because it's really important. We're in a relationship business with all the different businesses in the world chasing after everything. In real estate, we have to chase after relationships. It is the most important part of our business. After you get a little bit of a short talk in, it's time to start going over the CMA. Don't just hand them the CMA and watch them go over it. I can tell you exactly what they're going to do. They're going to go to the last page and look at the price. Go over it with them in detail. I forgot to mention before when you have a listing, make sure you print the entire listing sheet out because a lot of times on the CMA software, it just does the one photo. Make sure you include the entire gallery. That way there, you can go over it. And while you're going over it, don't be a jerk about it, but compare it to their home. 
when you're looking at it, go, yep. So we went over the house value and we're looking at it, the countertop. Unfortunately, yours are not granite, they're laminate, so we took a little bit off for that. And then you notice here, you see that the home has a second bath, which yours doesn't have. Because when you show them the one photo and the outside one, they always have something to say about how their home is better. But it's because they personally love the home. It isn't because they're trying to dupe you. It's because it's business. They want the most money possible, but also they have sentimental value in the home. So a lot of times they really think it's worth it. So by having all those photos with you, it's going to help you review it with them. As you go over it, make sure you go over all the graphs. Make sure you go over all the charts and ask them. Do you have any questions at this point? Did you see anything here that you want to look further into? Do you want to go out and look at any of these houses? If this house is on the market that are in a comparative price range, it's not a bad idea to go out and take a look at them if possible. Get out there, tour them, and review them with them. But anyways, continue reviewing this with them and watch their body language and everything. When you get to the last page when you're going to go over pricing, make sure you explain it deeply and see what they think. When they look at it, you'll be able to tell. You'll see the look that they have and you'll learn this look the longer you work in it. Make sure you field every question that they have, and if possible, when you're there, you want to get them to sign the listing agreement. We didn't talk about setting up the listing agreement because that's a whole nother podcast, but next time I'll talk about that. With the listing agreement, you want to make sure that you go over it with them and ask them if they have any questions. Ultimately, the point of the comparative market analysis is to get the signed listing agreement. So on this appointment, you really don't want to leave without that signed. So if they don't want to sign it quite yet, talk to them and ask them why. Ask them what their hesitation is, what else they need to accomplish. If they say they need to accomplish a meeting with another agent, then ask them what day and what time is that so that you can call them after and make sure everything went okay, that you're very interested in getting their home on the market and that you're very interested in working with them. Some agents are too much of a pushover when it comes to this situation. Almost every situation in real estate takes some awkward moments. We're always constantly asking people to sign paperwork that they're nervous about. We're constantly asking people to make offers over asking. We're constantly asking people a lot. We're asking them on a situation where they're about to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to make an irregular decision to what their mind says. So you need to be thoughtful of that and you need to make sure that you're always being their fiduciary. And as their fiduciary, sometimes with a seller's agent, sometimes with a buyer's agent, it's never a bad idea to give them good advice when you know you're going to sell their home. Never go out and do a comparative market analysis just to buy a property, as they call buying a listing, which is just overpricing the price just so you can agree with the seller. If you never do this, you can go out wholeheartedly and know that I'm here, I'm going to help you sell your home, I'm going to get you the most money possible, and I'm going to do a great job at it. If you go out with that attitude every day, there's nothing wrong with that. You're going to be a competitor in the marketplace, you're going to dominate, and people are going to notice it. It may not grow as fast as buying listings, but I can tell you that the growth you will have is steady, and it'll be a steady uphill growth to that six-figure earner you want to be. Thanks for joining us this week. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me directly through Facebook, Instagram, or any of the other social medias, as well as my email address is sean at seanpatrickmaloney.com. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast, and we'll see you here next week.